Praise him. Pray with me this morning. Father God, I thank you that where two or more are gathered, there you are in their presence. And Father, here we are, gathered together to praise you, to offer praise and glory and honor to your name. We dedicate and commit ourselves, our lives, our sacred honor in this time to you asking that your perfect will would be done in and through us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Church, we serve and are in relationship with an awesome God. And that is an amen. One of the things that I've told you before I really appreciate is how he begins to birth in me a message long before I'm ever asked to speak. And, and he's been doing that um, with one particular song for over a month. If you happen to be here with the last 10 minutes before service, John was playing a song over and over again that I've been hearing over and over again called Control by a, a group called Seven Avenue North, I believe. If you haven't heard it, you, you need to go find it. Um, I'll share the lyrics with you in just a minute, but I think what God is doing in, in, in the songs that he uses to minister to me, and, and it, it really is, it's three separate songs, one that we sang here a few weeks back. Just I, I'd heard it before, and I, I probably even had sung it before, but it really caught me that day. And then another old hymn, or an older hymn that we sing, had been driving home the point that I think God would have us have today, or the message the Lord would have for us today, and that's surrender. And when I talk about surrender, church, I'm not talking about giving up like in a combat situation where the enemy is so far beyond you and you can't win that you just say, I give up, I surrender. And and it's more than that. It's, It's a releasing ourselves to someone and something that is far greater than us. That's what I want to talk about. So listen to some of these these lyrics. Here I am, here I am, all my intentions. All my obsessions, I want to lay them all down. In your hands, God, only your love is vital. Though I'm not entitled, still you call me your child. God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me. Oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life and the way it should go. Somehow that frees me to open my hands up and give you control. When we begin to understand who God is, things take on a whole different focus. A few weeks ago in in our worship service, Chris asked us two questions. And maybe you remember, maybe you don't. They, They certainly impacted me that day. It's do you understand who God is and who you are? And I ask you this morning, is God a human sized deity that you can manage? Or is he slightly larger than humanity? Is he something or an idea or a concept that you can comprehend? Or is he simply the all-encompassing being who spoke everything that we know into existence? Who's overwhelmingly terrifying and awesome at the same time? That's who he is to me. I'm not easily intimidated. But when it comes to God, Boy, I'm a pile of mush when it turns my direction. God, you're so big. You're so mighty. You're so overwhelmingly powerful. And how about who you are in relationship to that God? Are you a peer? Are you a partner? Or are you a created being humbled in submission at the power of his presence? 
it's critical that we understand those two things because only when we really begin to grasp who God is and who we are in relationship to him that we can begin to surrender to his authority. I'm not going to surrender to just anyone. The truth is I will surrender to only one. Now there are people in my life who have authority over me and I will respond according to that authority. There are people who are physically bigger and could overpower me in a heartbeat and I'll, I'll understand that. But my heart will surrender to one only. To the one who can take my breath away literally and figuratively. And church, if you confess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the expectation is that you would do what he did. Look with me to the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the people at Philippi, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, we get a clear example of what Jesus did. If it's not coming, I'll grab my translation. I'm racing you, Dave. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. That's a fancy way of saying, do what Jesus did. Think what Jesus thought. Act like Jesus acted. Who Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. He took all that was due him and set it aside taking the form of a bondservant, which is a fancy word for slave. Coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. I could say he surrendered to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus' surrender to the absolute will of God cost him everything. Everything. It cost him his family. It cost him his friends. It cost him his dignity. It cost him his reputation. It cost him his comfort. It cost him his life. It cost him everything. There's no absolutely no doubt in my mind that Jesus knew fully what he was embracing when he embraced the cross. I don't think that Jesus went in as God. My sense is that Jesus went in 100% man who happened to also be God. Look at Hebrews 12, 2. It says it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. What allowed Jesus to go to the cross? He looked beyond the cross to what was coming. For the joy set before him, he endured it. Now let's think for, for a moment on the word joy. Joy is not a giddy feeling of happiness. Joy is more of an incredible sense of well-being that everything's going to be well. It's all going to be okay. Jesus was able to surrender himself in obedience to God because A, he trusted God, and B, he knew that through his obedience, all would be well. All would be well. And the all that he was looking at was you and me and every other human being. He would once for all make it right between God and man. The same thing is true of you and I. We can surrender when we trust God and when we know that it's going to be well. Is that your confession today? Do you know that you know that you know, no matter what this physical, human, mortal presence and time here on earth brings to you, all's going to be well? Amen. Have you looked beyond your cross to the throne? Have you looked beyond your cross to where Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father interceding for you? Have you looked beyond your experience, your trials, your tribulations, and your cross to the home, to the place he's prepared for you? We shouldn't be so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good, but we should bear in mind, I'm just passing through. These are momentary afflictions. 
I'm not belittling the pain or the, the struggles that you go through. I'm saying there's something bigger that we need to get our focus on. Now, was Jesus' surrender easy? I don't think so. Did Jesus skirt right through that process because he had God in him? No. Look at Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, 32 to 36. Look at that passage with me. And you, I want you to note specifically a couple of things in here. This is the night before Jesus was betrayed, or the, night, the very night he was betrayed, the night before he died. They came to a place that's called Gethsemane. And he took his disciples with him to this place. And he said, sit here while I pray. And then he took his three best buds, Peter, James, and John, took them a little deeper in the garden, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. I'm betting, church, that you know what those words mean. That if I gave you 30 seconds to one minute to sit on troubled and deeply distressed, you could pull up an experience or a memory that you have that you felt troubled or that you felt deeply distressed over. Not an easy thing. And then as you go down a little further, he went a little farther in the garden by himself. He fell on the ground. He prayed, if it's possible, that the hour would pass. He said, Father, all things are possible. Take it away. But, not what I want, what you want. Jesus was ask, actually asking God for a way out, a way around the cross. Yes, he counted the cost. Yes, he knew what was coming. And yet he chose it. Not my will, not what I want, but what you want. Surrender's not easy, church. Setting aside our will, if there's something I don't like about me, it's the fact that I have a free will. There are days I wish that God would have just made me an automaton to just obey him because my will gets me into trouble all the time. We just finished a 21-day fast. How many of you experienced time where your flesh screamed out at you? Feed me! And that's just food. Our will, our wishes, our desires, for whatever purpose, noble or otherwise, surrendering that's not natural. It's not in our makeup. We were created with a free will. We were created with a strong mind. We were created with thoughts and ideas and dreams and wishes, all these things. But if we're going to live the life that God intended for us, then surrender we must. That's just a fact. If we're going to fully enter in to what God designed us to be and what God designed us to do, we got to surrender. My goodness, if we just focus for just a fraction of a moment on the Great Commission, how many here would say, I have to surrender to obey the Great Commission. I know it's not just me and Jonathan. I know there are a few others. It's not easy. But surrender we must. So next question is, why would a reasonably sane person surrender themselves when we're not designed to do that? We're actually created with a fight or flight syndrome. It's built into us. Well, according to Matthew chapter 16, because he said so. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, anyone must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Where did Jesus go? Jesus went to the masses. Jesus went to the unloved, to the unaccepted, to the sinners, to the broken, and to the cross. But, oh, church, he also went to the throne. He also went to the throne. What, whoever desires his life, desires to save, it's going to lose it. If you lose it for my sake, you'll find it. Don't you love God's economy? So backwards from ours. What profit is it to you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? It's telling us right there. You must surrender. You must take up his cross, and you must walk the way he walked. If we're going to follow him and claim to be his disciples, we not only have to do what he did, we must do what he instructed us to do. In John 14, I don't think I asked them to put it up, and you don't have to, Dave. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
Test that one. If I asked you, do you love Jesus? I bet you 100% would raise your hand. But if I asked you, did you keep his commandments? I don't know that any one of us could raise our hand. Strive to, yeah. Succeed? Not always. We have examples in scriptures of folks who surrender themselves. God is so good. He has filled his word with examples for us of people just like us. We tend to make supernatural people like Peter and Paul and Mary and Joseph and James and John. The truth is they're just humans. They were just people who sold out, sold out to him. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 38. You see people surrendering dreams and plans for the call of God. Here we see Mary's example. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary clearly had a sense of who she was in Christ and her relationship to him. The angel came to her with a proposition and a proposal. And the only thing she said is, how? How can that be? I've never been with a man. When the angel told her how, look what she says. Behold, the, man, the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Now, in our words, it's like she was saying, look, angel, I'm God's servant. If he orders it so, I'll accept it. If that's God's plan, sign me up. I'll do it. Now, do you think for a minute she uttered those words unaware of the cost of that surrender? If you have done any study of Scripture at all, if you've read the Word at all, you will know that women found in child, found pregnant outside of marriage could be stoned to death. That had to have run through her mind. It's exciting to have an angel visit you. But it's terrifying at the same time. Somebody had said it's amazing that in the Bible it it says, fear not. The angels always say fear not when they meet people. There's a good reason. They're scary. They pop out of nowhere and they're big. And they come with messages that often are challenging. And yet she she had to grasp this concept. Have you considered that she had to go home and explain to her parents, to her fiance, to her friends, to the church, to the village that she's pregnant? I'm not surprised she went away to see Elizabeth. I would have too. Next donkey out of town, I'm on it. Mary had to consider these things. The cost of surrender. But surrender she did. And she didn't do it after chewing on it for a day or two or three or four. Sometimes the Lord speaks a message to me. I chew on it for a bit. Because I don't want to just flippantly tell God yes and then not do it. I want my yes to be yes and my no to be no. But Mary had a fraction of a moment. Didn't say the angel tarried with her for days or hours. The angel came and he encountered her. She had to run this thing through her mind pretty quickly and then say, yes. Yes. Yes, Lord, I'll surrender to your plan, to your will. Now let's bring it home, church. What's God asking you to surrender? Your pin drop. What are you willing to surrender? What are you willing to give God? If somehow miraculously today you encountered an angel and they said, fear not, are you ready? What can he have? What part of your life can God have? Well, he can have the Sunday morning piece, Sue. And he can have the Wednesday night piece. But the Monday to Friday stuff, I got that. Eight to five, I got that. Hmm. Surrendering all. In Matthew 16, verse 24, we read a little bit of Matthew 16 before, we see what Jesus asks of those who are willing to follow him. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. No to me, yes to you. No to me, yes to you. Following Jesus is the highest calling of any person. It just doesn't get any bigger than being invited to follow after Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but identifying with him is the key to my existence. But never has it been offered or held out to me as easy. Never easy. 
Jesus said quite the opposite. Jesus said that wide and broad is the path that leads to destruction. Anybody can get on that path. I think you're there by virtue of being born. But narrow and difficult is the path to life. It's a challenge. He also said that if the world hated him, it would hate us. If they've, if they've caused me to suffer, they will cause you to suffer. We sit here in America comfortable in our Christianity while brothers and sisters around the world suffer horribly for their faith. Challenge you to read about some of the, the martyrs. Pastor was talking about oath of the martyrs. They pay high prices. Read them. Let it lead you to prayer for them and for yourself that you would have that same type of attitude, that you're willing to lay it all down. As we choose to follow Jesus, we're wise to count the cost. Always, always, always count the cost. Because surrendering our will, surrendering our way, surrendering our desire, and our hopes and our dreams, it's not easy. But if we do, we will find that the eternal plan far outweighs anything this world has to offer. God's retirement plan is out of this world, literally. Now let's look back for a minute at those songs, the, song, the lyrics of the song Control. When we take an honest look at our intentions and our obsessions, and we stand them up against the love that God has for us, I mean, really, here's God's love and here's what I want. It's an easy step to confession that only his love is vital. Only his love, only our relationship with him really matters. Everything else is just stuff. This is the key to life. When we attempt to measure ourselves against God, we see how incredibly short we fall. He's a big, big God, and I'm not. Not stopping there, we can celebrate that just despite our shortcomings, he calls us his own. How many times have people said, you are a child of God? And you say, yeah, I am, but really understand what it means to be a child. My children have a right to everything in my life. Whatever John and I have, it's available to our children. And they will inherit what little we have to offer at the end of our lives. It's theirs by virtue of them being our children. We, church, as children of God, have that same right. Everything that God offers is ours by virtue of being his children. Have you truly considered and fully grasped the idea that he doesn't need you and yet some way wants you? That one blows me away. He doesn't need me, but he wants me. I've told you that story before. I'm driving up the interstate, up 205. God, I'm just not worthy of you. I struggle with sin, and I try to do right, and I screw up, and God, I'm just not worthy. And God whispers back, you're right, you're not. And that was like a punch in the stomach, but he followed it quickly with, but you're mine, and I love you. And that's where it ends. He doesn't need me, and yet he wants us. Since that very first sin in the Garden of Eden, God has been working to restore fellowship with the man who had distanced himself from God by man's choices. God made covenant after covenant. I mean, he made a covenant with Adam, and a covenant with Moses, and a covenant with David, and a covenant with Abraham. He made covenant after covenant after covenant, and he was faithful every time. So why did he have to create new covenants? Because man wasn't faithful. And then there was the final covenant, the covenant of blood. And God still is faithful when we aren't to that. God's faithful to his word. He doesn't need us. He could quite easily, after Adam and Eve, pull the do-over. He kind of did pull a do-over with Noah. God could create a whole race of people who want to enter into relationship with him and who want to stay in fellowship with him. He doesn't need us, but he loves us. And again, when we really begin to grasp that church, our response of surrender is more normal. It's more typical. 
When I think of what you've done for me, Father God, there's nothing, there, well, there, there's not enough that I can do. Isn't that what love is? Doing for the object of our affection? Love is not about me getting my stuff met. Love is about me focusing on the object of my affection and pouring myself into making that reality. I mean, God, as pastors often taught us, God uses types here on earth, and the biggest one is marriage. I spend a lot of my time and my energy trying to anticipate my husband's needs and meet them and do the things that bless him because I love him. Because he has done so much in love to me, my response is just to love him back. When I comprehend what God has done for me, that he has, he's not just made salvation, but he called me. He sought me. He came after me, and he worked things in my life so that I would know him and be invited into relationship with him. And he continues to pursue me and provide for me and bless me immeasurably. How can I not want to give him all that I am and all that I have? He doesn't need us, but he wants us. When we grasp that, surrender is normal. And if that wasn't enough, God says, I have a plan for your life. I have a plan to redeem you and to restore you. Redeem you might be a church word, but what it means is I'm buying you back. You have been sold into sin, and I'm buying you back. He paid the ultimate price to Satan. He paid his blood. It says that the life is in the blood. He paid that for you and for me. I redeemed you. I'll restore you. I'll make you, I'll take you and make you back to the place that I designed for you before you were even conceived. Have you grasped the idea that God has a plan and a purpose for your life that only you can fulfill? And that if you don't fulfill it, it goes unmet? And those who, who choose a life of sin... There's a gap, but when you come back to Jesus, he says, I'll take you and I'll make you back to the way I designed you to be. My hope and my plan and my desire for a beautiful child. He'll put us back there, back to the place where he designed you to be. How many of us have bought into the lies of the enemy, have pursued things that we thought would lead to something wonderful, only to find ourselves in the pit of despair and loss? I don't ask you to raise your hand because it's probably true of every one of us. We buy lies. Satan is a master salesman. He has used the internet and social media and television and radio to sell a bunch of garbage. He dresses it up and makes it look really nice, but it's still garbage. And we buy it thinking we're getting something good, something wonderful, something that'll make me feel fulfilled for all of my life. Hooray! And then you open the package and it's garbage. And you're in despair all over again. It's times like that that we see God do some of his best work. If you've read the scripture, do you remember the woman with the issue of blood? Do you remember the woman who was caught in adultery? Do you remember the widow at Nain? Hopeless causes, each and every one of them. But Jesus offered forgiveness. Jesus offered healing, and Jesus offered resurrection. Do you remember the beggar who met Peter and John outside of the, outside of the temple after the Holy Spirit had come upon them? And they asked him for alms. He asked, they asked, he asked them for alms. He said, silver and gold we have none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Do you remember what he did? He didn't rise up and walk, did he? He went walking and leaping and praising God probably a long way down the road. The ladies at church this uh, Wednesday this week, there was a video, and it was, there was a story in the video about a young man in a fairly conservative church, definitely not Pentecostal because they didn't raise their hands and they didn't dance. But there's this young man who has come to this church and he sits in the front row and he dances every service. And he dances by himself. And this, the person who was telling the story said, finally I wanted to go get to know this young man and I went up and I said, tell me your story. 
want to know about this dancing. And he said to her, when I was younger, got into some bad situations and made some mistakes, and um, ultimately I was on the wrong end of a gun that took a life. So as a young juvenile, he had killed somebody. And he went into the juvenile system, knowing full well that when he reached the age of 18, he was going to go adult, to adult prison. And he said, I sat in that, in that juvenile detention system for years, dreading the day I turned 18. Because I knew when I was 18, I was going to adult prison. And I knew enough to know that I'd be there for many years, and there was nothing good about it for me. And my life really was over. And he said, when I just about was 18, they called me into the hearing where they would address this. And he said, I looked at the room, and there was a sense of, of something in that room that was different. He said, I expected foreboding and a stern message and a harsh sentence. And he said, it was almost like my judge and, the, and my lawyer had colluded. And when it came time, I stood up in front of the judge, and the judge said, the decision's been made to grant you release. And the story is told that the mother of the person who was killed had written a letter to the judge on his behalf, imploring him to apply grace to this life. And he said, if, if, if that kind of grace could be applied to my life, I will spend the rest of my life dancing before a God who makes that possible. Oh, wow, oh, wow indeed. Church, what have you been saved from? What have you been saved to? And have you really comprehended that? When was the last time you just threw all of it out with abandon and raised up your hands and threw back your head and just belted out your praise or danced before the Lord and just poured all of you into your adoration of him? When you understand what he's done, I think when you really grasp that concept, we too will take our hands off our situations and give him control. Open up our hands and give him control. We serve a powerful God. Imagine just for a minute some of that power. Consider what it must have been like to be a creation. I almost wish I could go back in time and watch him speak it into creation. Boom, God spoke and it was. How incredibly powerful. Now, if he could do that, what might he do in a life that surrendered to him? God's power working in us, God's power working for us. A song that we have sung here is by a group called Hillsong United. It's called The Stand. I want you to listen to a piece of the lyrics that it's got. You spoke all life into motion. You stood before my failure. You carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stand. Now again, think just for a minute what he's saying here. Jesus, you took all of my sin, past, present, and future. You took it all, and you let it put upon your shoulders. I've always been a believer that Jesus Christ died not of crucifixion, but of a broken heart. Because my sin cost him fellowship with his father. The father turned away from Jesus Christ. When the, when the sin of humanity was placed on Jesus' shoulders, the Father could no longer look at him. I think he died of a broken heart. We've all experienced falling out of favor with somebody that we love and how it hurts. I know times I've said or done something and I see a look of hurt on John's face and it's just like a punch in the stomach. It's like, I did that. And I want to do everything I can to make it better and make that look go away. Because that look haunts me. Now think about that with God. My sin on his shoulders. Yeah, my soul's now going to stand. And it says, so what can I say and what could I do? But offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. Is that your confession today? When you pause and you consider what the one who knows you best and loves you beyond comprehension thinks about you, are you drawn to surrender? Does it make you want to just rush up and give him all of it and say, God, here, here, here's what I have. It might be like that little 
bunch of wilted dandelions that my little boy brought years ago. But it's the best he had to offer, and it was precious. And that bunch of little wilting dandelions got place in the prettiest vase in my house and a place of prominence on the table because of who it was and what he was offering. Are you drawn to that? Are you running to God with you? Paul teaches in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, that the one to whom you surrender yourself, don't you know, that the one to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, to obey, you're that one's slaves. The one to whom you surrender yourself is the one who will determine your eternal destiny. The one whose voice you're hearing and responding to in the back of your head. Do this, don't do that. Who's that voice? Are you following Frank Sinatra's song and doing it my way? Or are you willing to step out in faith and make that confession of yet another popular chorus? All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Is that your confession? Now, in closing this morning, I want to read a quote from Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers, you may know of him. He was an early 20th century Scottish Baptist and holiness movement evangelist and teacher, most known for a book called My Utmost for His Highest. If you've never read it, I challenge you to get it. It's a devotional that you can read again and again. Here's what he says. True surrender will always go beyond natural devotion. If we will only give up, God will surrender himself to embrace all those around us and will meet their needs, which were created by our surrender. Beware of stopping short of total surrender to God. Most of us have only a vision of what this really means, but have never truly experienced it. Now I say, church, just because few have experienced true surrender and all that God will do with our surrender is not a reason to not go after it. More than ever, be that one. Be that one soul who will pursue surrender to God. If you've not surrendered your life, your will, your dreams, and your plans to the Father, then I encourage you to begin to do that today. Because I think that in doing it, you're going to find more freedom than you ever thought possible. You are surrendering yourself to servanthood or to slavehood to the one true God, and yet you'll be more free than you'd ever comprehend. Doesn't make sense, does it? I choose to be a slave, and I have freedom, as opposed to I choose to live free and I'm enslaved. Drawing nearer to his heart, drawing nearer to his will, drawing nearer to his dreams and his plans for your life, I think you'll be blessed beyond measure. Church, this morning, if you have a need to pray about this issue, I invite you to come. If surrender is not your need and you have another need, please, I implore you, I beg you, do not go out that door with a need when the living God is here present today to meet that need, to meet you personally, to touch you and your situation. God is never going to force himself on you. He invites you, says, come, come to me, come meet with me. He's prepared a banquet of spiritual blessings for us if we just come. Then you get to walk upon salvation. Then you have a spirit alive in you, your life to declare God's promise, your soul now to stand. So again, I ask you, what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. If you have a need, come, church. We will be more than pleased to pray with you. Seems like all I can see was the struggle. Haunted by ghost that lived in my past Bound 
bound up in shackles of all my failures. Wondering how long is this gonna last? Then you look at this prisoner and you say to me, son, Stop fighting a fight It's already been won I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be.